Do you get tired of waiting on the Lord? Have you ever been in a situation where it just seems like God doesn't know your problems? Have you ever felt like you just can't go on anymore? Well, today we're going to look at a lesson about waiting, a lesson about faith. And in this lesson, you're going to find that there is faith in the power of God. Sunday, Sunday, this the place to be. I know the perfect school just for you and me. Fill you with the word, it'll set you free. So grab a seat, it's Sunday school with the dig, with the dig, he's got a word for you and me, with the dig, with the dig, he's got a word for you and me. Welcome to another edition of Sunday School with the Deke. I am Deacon Wallace Hill IV proud member of the Mount Pisgah Missionary Baptist Church, where my father, Wallace Hill III, is the pastor. It's an honor for me to have you to take the time out of your busy schedule to join me every week for the Sunday School lessons that are based on the International Lesson Series. For those of you that are new, do me a favor. Go to the bottom of the page and hit the subscribe button. Then click that little bell right next to it, and each week you'll be notified. The Deke has uploaded another lesson. So the goal of Sunday School with the Deke is to bring the Word of God to life in your life and to give you understanding of the scriptures and to make the Word of God real, interesting, and in an integral part of your everyday living. And we try to have a little bit of fun while we do it. Ultimately, I'd like, uh, I'd hope that these lessons will inspire those who don't have a relationship with Christ to come asking, what must I do to be saved? So today, be today we begin our third unit of our winter quarter. I know that gets a little tongue-tied sometimes, but I told you last week, that our quarter is entitled Faith That Pleases God. This last unit that we're in right here for the quarter is called The Righteous Live by Faith. So in this unit, we're going to have four lessons. Uh, one out of the book of Isaiah, two out of the book of Daniel, and one out of the book of Habakkuk. You're probably like, Habakkuk? <laughs> anyway, uh, in these lessons, it's my prayer that we'll be able to see how the righteous live by faith. And then by studying these lessons, you know, I hope that we'll all, that it'll allow all of us um, to live by faith and apply it in our lives whenever we come across these situations. Listen, I, I, I know it's hard sometimes. It's, trust me, I know. Um, but it's hard sometimes to, to see how things are going to get better, whatever you're going through in your life. But the Bible defines faith as the substance. That means something tangible. Substance of things hoped for. And the evidence of things unseen. Now, that's faith. When you can, you have evidence of something that you can't see. That's believing that it's there. Faith is not a blind belief or a gullibility, or wishful thinking. Faith is not na naively accepting, you know, fairy tales, uh, or just saying what sounds right. Because a lot of times we'll just say, oh, I know God got this, but you don't really know God got this. You know what I'm saying? So faith is acting in full confidence that God would do as he has promised us that he would do. And according to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, <laughs> the one who was born from a virgin, 
walk this earth for 33 and a half years, die for our sins. According to Jesus Christ, he uh, said all we need is a little bit of faith to accomplish great things. If you look at, uh, Jesus tells us in Matthew 17 and 20, he says, I tell you the truth. <laughs> my dog is barking because I locked him up and I don't want him to disturb my lesson. But guess what he's doing? He's disturbing my lesson. Anyway, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. If you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible if you just have the faith of a mustard seed. So I hope that over these next four weeks, you'll be able to see examples of true faith, uh, true faith in these scriptures, and, and hopefully it's going to transform your life so that whatever you may go through or whatever may come your way, that you can draw off these lessons to help you in your daily life. And that's what it's all about, right? That's why God left this word for us. So, so let's go ahead and get into our lesson for this week. Uh, our lesson is in the book of Isaiah. Um the 40th chapter, and I'll begin by giving you the backdrop to the lesson. Um, we're in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah was one of God's true prophets, a pro and now a prophet for people, and I, I try not to teach like everybody knows what's going on, because somebody just might be my Facebook friend and just decide to click uh, on my link for the first time, and, and, and I want to be able to speak to you as well, right? So a prophet was one in the Old Testament uh, the prophet was one of God, uh, a person who God had called to go and speak uh, on his behalf. God would speak to the prophet, and then they would go tell the people what thus said the Lord, right? So more times than not, the people were stubborn, just like, you know, us, and wouldn't listen. Always choosing to do what they wanted to do instead of doing what God would have them to do. And just like most uh, of God's prophets, Isaiah spoke um, of things that were to come in the far dist in distant future. Uh, but he also spoke of things that were going on right at that time. That's how all the prophets spoke. Sometimes they'll be saying things like it was happening right then and there, but really it's something that was going to happen a thousand years from now. And so that's why you got to study really hard when you when you're reading the Old Testament, and you're reading uh, the prophets. So, um, the pro prophets were pretty private people for the most part, uh, except Jeremiah and Hosea. They were pretty, they let you in on, on their life a little bit. They didn't, but most prophets didn't put their personalities into their prophecies. Um, and so we don't know a whole lot about Isaiah personally. You know, we know he served during the time of, like, King Isaiah. Uh, King J uh, uh, Jothan, um, King Ahaz, and King Hezekiah. We know he was he was around during those times. Uh, but Isaiah was a great prophet. There are sixty six quotes from Isaiah in the New Testament. That tells you a lot. So twenty out of the twenty seven books in the New Testament has at least. Uh, one direct quote from Isaiah. Uh, so, you you know what you can find in Isaiah? You can find uh, the prophecy about the birth of Christ, the prophecy about the life of Christ, the prophecy about the death of Christ, the prophecy about his resurrection, uh, the prophecy about his second coming is even mentioned in Isaiah. So, specifically, here in chapter 40, is is a chapter designed to bring comfort to anyone who reads it. Now, you know, we, we shouldn't forget because, you know, we forget sometimes. But God is the God of all comfort. He wants to comfort his people. He really does. Um, but that doesn't mean he's always going to remove the source of your pain. But he can provide comfort in your pain. So this chapter is, is, is written against the background of 39 chapters announcing that God was going to bring judgment on Israel. 
Isaiah kept warning them. He kept warning the people. 39 chapters, and that probably spanned over some years, 39 chapters that they needed to get their act together or they would suffer and go into captivity. And that's why I love God so much because he's so patient with us and he loves us so much that he gives us ample opportunity, ample chances to get ourselves together before he brings punishment on us. And that's why I can say that that here, even in this captivity that he, that he had Isaiah talk to warn them about was a result of his love for them. Sometimes God chastises us because he loves us. You know, even as parents, we give our kids opportunity after opportunity to get it right. You know, before we give them the punishment that we kept warning them would come if they continue to do the way, go about the ways that go contrary to what we tell them or what we expect, right? Eventually, Israel does not listen to God. He does, they don't listen to God's word. They don't listen to Isaiah. And they do get taken into captivity. But here in chapter 40, God tells Isaiah to tell them that even when they are in captivity, even when you're going through your problem, that even while they're going through a terrible time, even while they can't, they can't see the, the, the light of day, even if it seems like God has walked away, that if you have faith in him, he will comfort you during that difficult time. There's a verse in Psalms 23 where, where uh, he, the 23rd Psalms where he said, uh, uh, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, he'll sit a table in the midst of your enemies, right? Um, he'll make you lie down in green pasture. I mean, while you're proud, while you got all these problems going on around you, enemies surrounded you, he'll fix a, a, a table in the midst of them where you can just sit down and have your nice steak dinner and so much stuff is going on around you. It, that's the comfort of God to know that he's always there with you, that you can, you can close your eyes at night and know that whatever problem that you have, God is going to take care of it. My dog is making all kinds of noise upstairs. Anyway, that's the devil. <laughs> I'm trying to give words of comfort, and then the devil that got in my dog upstairs running around making noise. But anyway, but uh, you see, even though God told Isaiah to tell them they're going to get put into captivity because of their actions, uh, he also told Isaiah to tell them that, that he will rescue them out of it as well. So it's up to the people to wait on God. And during their waiting, they needed to have faith. This whole chapter is about waiting and having faith. Uh, this lesson opens up with verse 12 and 13 and then skips to 25 through 31. I don't plan to read all the verses leading up to verse uh, to chapter 12. But I will call out a few verses, uh, not in the lesson, just, just to set the tone. Um, so let's go ahead and get into the lesson. And oh, by the way, I'm rocking my uh, Grand Blank High School cheer, uh, uh, cheerleading sweatshirt today. Um, my daughter's team, y'all know my daughter Alex, y'all know her as the word girl. Uh, for those who've been watching over the years, uh, they won their league championship on Thursday, so I'm proud, I'm a proud cheer dad. And then also I have to shout out my grandson Noah. Uh, yesterday was his birthday; he turned two. So happy birthday, Noah! GW loves you. Uh, now that that's over with, let's get into the lesson. But before I do, I must say this: today's date is February fourth, two thousand twenty-four. Our lesson text is Isaiah. Chapter 40, verses 12 and 13, and 25 through 31. Our lesson title is Faith in the Power of God. Grab your Bible, grab your books, grab your pen, grab your paper, and let's get into today's lesson. Verse 1, I'm going to start with verse 1. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people with your, uh, said your God. 
Now, this is not in the lesson, but I've told you I want to open up with a couple of verses. God is telling Isaiah to comfort his people. Give them a message of hope. Get, you know, he says, give your burdens to me. You know, this verse reminds me of a New Testament uh, verse in 2 Corinthians. Um, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. He says, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforted, comforteth us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherein with we ourselves are comforted of God. <laughs> so he says, he said, God comforts us in our tribulations. God comforts us when we're going through things, but he does it so that we can be able to comfort other people when they go through stuff, right? By the comfort that God gave us, we ourselves are comforted of God. So, he's just, so God is a God of comfort. And so just like any parent that has to, had to rebuke their children or their kids, after a time, you know, we go to comfort them. I know, I've written, you know, I love Pastor Hill. I love Pastor Hill. My pastor, Pastor Hill, is my dad, too. And I can tell you, I've gotten some whoopings. And, 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 and afterwards, I've gotten the love to say, I, you know, I, I didn't want to do that, but he had to do it, right? So, some, you know, we as parents, you know, we may rebuke you, but then we comfort you to let you know, hey, I still love you. But sometimes you just got to go through some things. Verse 2. Speak ye comfortably. He's still talking to Isaiah. He's telling Isaiah what to tell them. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now, Isaiah, a lot of the Old Testament prophets is hard to read. So I'm going to bounce this one off to the New Living Translation so you can kind of see better what God told Isaiah to tell the people. Look, in verse 2, he says, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for all her sins. So he's, he's, he's telling Isaiah to tell them, look, uh, you did your time. Right. He, he, he says, I want you to give them comforting words to them. Don't whisper it, but cry unto them. He says, their punishment is now at an end. Uh, the cause of your trouble is removed. You know, your sins are now pardoned. Your sins have been paid for. You did the time. Now, the crazy part about all of this that he's, he's writing to Israel right now is that it hadn't even happened yet. <laughs> This is the crazy part. They hadn't gone to war yet. They hadn't even been taken into captivity by the Assyrian army yet. But God tells Isaiah to speak to them now as though they had already gone into captivity. And, and, and now they're about to get rescued by God. Man, this is deep. I'll, if you need to slow this down a little bit, then go ahead and do it. Because I want you to get what he's saying. They hadn't gone through their captivity yet. They hadn't gone through their their troubles yet, but God is telling Isaiah to tell him right now that that uh, to be comforted and that their sins have been paid for. <laughs> but they ain't, they haven't paid for the sins yet. But He said they've been paid for. So, so this is the kind of comfort that God wants us to have in Him. He wants us to see the light at the end of the tunnel. He wants us to see the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. He wants us to have the type of faith in him that we can find joy and comfort in, in him, even if we haven't gone through the battle yet, or, or while we're in the battle, or while we're in the midst of the storm. He wants us to find comfort in him. You see, God sees everything from the end to the beginning. And I remember the first time my, my pastor, my dad said this, it was so profound. And it, I mean, it's so simple, but yet it's so profound and true. God sees everything from the end to the beginning. You know, we are the ones, we're the humans. We can only see things from the beginning to the end. So God has been where we're going. So, so that's why he, we can find comfort in him because he knows that what's going to happen in the end, 
right? So, okay, so let's jump to verse 12, uh, which is in our lesson. Verse 12 says, Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and met it out heaven with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? Y'all like, deek? I'm about to cut this off. I don't understand nothing that that verse just said. <laughs> I get it. So I'm going to read from the New Living Translation again to help us out. Uh, he said, who else has held the oceans in his hand? Who has measured, the, 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 uh, measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth or has uh, weighed the mountains and the hills on a scale? So I love this verse. Because God doesn't just tell Isaiah to tell the people to have comfort. Here he tells them why they should have comfort. This is one of those verses that if, 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 if I would put it in today's terms uh, or even in slang terms, this verse is saying something like this. Uh, Don't you know who I am? I am God. I erected. The, I, I erect. I created, not erected, created this whole earth without lifting a finger. I hung the stars. I created the sun and the moon. If I can do that, don't you think I can get you out of any situation that you might find yourself in? He says here in verse, he says here um, in this verse, okay, the new lizard, ah, man, I can't. The New Living Translation makes it a little easier to understand. He asked them three questions that he knows they know the answer to. He says, who else has held the oceans in his hand? Who has measured off the, the uh, heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth uh, or has weighed the mountains and hills on a scale? This verse is an example uh, of what we call... Um, Anthropo anthro anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism. Ah. Anthropomorphism is basically what I did earlier, right? Anthropomorphism is 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 speaking of God in human terms. So we can partially understand who he is and what he does, right? I was saying earlier, I was like, don't you know who I am? That I was, you know, trying to put that in human terms. So we can partially understand who he is, you know, because God is a spirit. So we know he doesn't physically hold the oceans in the cup of his hand, uh, you know, or he's not standing on the earth with a tape measure, like uh, measuring uh, the lengths of the heavens. Um, so God knows exactly how many grains of dust there are on the earth. You know, even if a person knew the number of hairs on, on their head, and, you know, as God knows, God says he knows that in Luke 12 and 7. He said, God says he knows the number of hairs on your head. So they could never, if even if a person knew the number of hairs on their head, they could never calculate the dust in their own house, let alone on the earth. So, but God is so great. You know, he dominates over all creation. He is creation. So, you know, that, that, that because of that, we can stand in awe of his power and his glory. Let's go to verse 13. Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, hath taught him? So I, I probably should have put 12 and 13 together, but I didn't. You know, another aspect of God is to behold his great wisdom. He knows all. He knows what's best. He, he You see... God has raw intelligence to know how much dust there is in the earth and how heavy the mountains and the hills are. But more than that, God has the wisdom to use that knowledge. God is so wise that no one has, has directed the spirit of the Lord. You know, no one has taught God anything. You know, that's why, you know, we need to have faith in him. That's what he's saying. You know, nobody, nobody's greater than me. Can't nobody tell me nothing. I am creation. I am whatever you need me to be. So now our lesson skips to um, verse 25. But I just want to call out one more verse 
That's not in our lesson, okay? Verse 15. 15 says, Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. And I really love this verse. I've, I've read it before and I use this a lot because especially when you got problems that you think are so huge. Look what he says. Behold, the nations are a drop of a bucket. Look, look at it in the New Living Translation. Uh, no, for all the nations of the world are but a drop in the bucket. It's nothing. They are nothing more than dust on the scale. Have you ever seen a scale? You might have a little dust. That dust ain't making the scale go down. It's nothing. He says, your problems are like dust on a scale. They're nothing to me. He picks up the whole, um, the, the, the New Living Translation says, he picks up the whole earth as though it were a grain of sand. So God is letting us know that he can get them out of any of, of this mess, get them out of that mess that they're in. You know, their problems, you know, going into captivity is like a drop in a bucket to him. You know, what is that? It's a piece of dust on a scale. It does not matter. It has no effect. Your problems have no effect in his hand. Nothing is too great for him to deal with, right? You know, it says islands are like dust in his hand. He could pick up a whole, he could pick up the whole island of Jamaica or Turks and Caicos or whatever. There's, that's nothing to him, right? Your problems are nothing to God. In this case, Isaiah was talking to the people about their troubles with other nations. He said, but in your case, he could be talking about any problem you may be facing right now, big or small. It's still like dust on a scale to him. It's nothing to God. He can fix anything. So that's one of my favorite verses. But anyway, so I'm going to read uh, verses 16 through 24 from the Living Translation because it needs to. Because when I just tried to just start back at 25, it just made no sense. So I'm going to just read 16 through 24. Um, all the wood in Lebanon's forest and all the Lebanon's animals would not be enough to make a burnt offering worthy of your God. The nations of the world are worth nothing to him. In his eyes, they count for less than nothing, more emptiness and froth, mere emptiness and froth. To whom can you compare God? What image can you find to resemble him? Can he be compared to an idol formed in a mold, overlaid with gold and decorated with silver chains? Or if, peop or if people are too poor for that, they might at least choose wood that won't decay and the, and the skilled craftsmen to carve an image that won't fall down. Haven't you heard? I'm going to actually use this verse later in our lesson. But verse 21 says, haven't you heard? Don't you understand? Are you deaf to the words of God? The words he gave before the world began? Are you so ignorant? These, this is the words that, these are the words that God told Isaiah to tell the people because they were acting like, you know, he wasn't going to be able to help them through this situation. And God said, don't you know who I am? Haven't you heard? Don't you understand? You know, are you, are you deaf to the words of God? The words he gave before the world began? Are you so ignorant? God sits above the circle of the earth. The people below him, below seem like grasshoppers to him. He looks down from heaven. He's like grasshoppers, little bitty grasshoppers. There's nothing. You know, he spreads out the heavens like a curtain. You have a curtain, you open the curtain. He can spread the heavens out like that. Sunshine come streaming through. Verse 23, he judges the great people of the world, people who, the high and mighty politicians who think they, they run everything. Verse 23, 23 says, he judges the great people of the world and brings them all to nothing. 24 says, they hardly get started, barely taking root. When he blows on them and they wither, the wind carries them off like a chaff. Then verse 25 is where our lesson kicks back in. It says, to whom then will you liken me? Or shall I be equal? Said the Holy One. 
So, so God runs down all that. Don't you know? Haven't you heard? I can do this. I can do that. Nothing is too great for me. And then verse 25 says, so, so who are you going to liken me to? Who, who is my equal? Says the Holy One. You know, so since he can bring any man down to nothing, he said that earlier, he asked the question, who is my equal? God told Isaiah to write that no one will ever be able to compare to him. There is no one or no thing that is equal to him. So if you got a rascal in your life that you worried about or scared of, give him to God. He just said he will blow them away like the stubble. It doesn't even have to be a person. It could be anything that you're going through, right? Or any problem that you have. Now, I will say this, and listen close. If there's anything that is equal to God or better than God, it's because we make it that way. I want that to sink in for a minute. We are the ones that deem things to be more important than God. Think about it. We put so much before him. We put almost everything before him. And then we want to say that he's our God. Anyway, I won't go down that path. Uh, but I just wanted to throw that out there. God has no equal. He calls himself in this verse, I am the Holy One. Verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high and behold who hath created these things that bringeth out their hosts by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is, he is, the, he is strong in power, not one fail, faileth. New Living Translation says, look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each of those stars by their name because of this great power and incomparable strength not a single one is missing. So Isaiah takes us on a little astrology lesson here uh, 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 and a psychology lesson at the same time. He says, so if you're down and out, pick your head up. He says, look at the sky. That's all the evidence you need. See the stars. Tell me who created the stars. What kind of mind would even come up with sprinkling the sky with these shiny little objects that Take your breath away on a clear night. Isaiah says, God calls them out like an army, one by one. Each one of those stars have to obey him. And not a single star is missing because of God's power. Now, I will say, just like you might see a fallen star every now and then, um, God will put that star back in his rightful place. You know, because sometimes we fall too. We might be some fallen stars, but God picks us up and puts us right back in place. So tell me, this the same God that can, you know, the same God that does hang stars in the sky, tell me he can't hang stars in your life. Tell me this same God with the same imagination can't come up with something so brilliant and perfect for your life. Tell me God can't get you that job. Tell me God can't heal your body. Tell me God can't fix your marriage. Tell me God can't get you better grades. Sometimes we need to have Sunday school lessons like this to remind us the kind of God we serve. He said, don't you know who I am? So, you know, just like he orders the sun into place every day and the moon into place every night, He orders the rain, he orders the storms, he orders the rainbows. He can order anything in or out of your life. Verse 27. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speaketh, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? So, so, Isaiah is delivering a message from God here. Isaiah is warning, you know, is warning to know why they are questioning God. He used the term old Jacob and old Israel to shame them. That's what he's doing here. He's shaming them because they had a, they had a, 
They had a covenant with God. Israel had a covenant with God. A, a, a pact, a contract, an agreement. There's a lot in why he said he called them Jacob and then he called them Israel next. See, the 12 tribes of Israel were the 12 sons of Jacob. Jacob had 12 kids and they became the 12 tribes of Israel. So God changed Jacob's name to Israel after he finally got his life right and started trusting and following God like he should have been. So in this verse, he calls them by their old name and then their new name to let them know that he understands them through and through. He understands their evolution. So I'm going too deep here. So, so I'm going to go ahead and get back to the lesson. But why do you think, he, he, he said, he, God is saying, why do you think I've forgotten about you? Why are you saying that I don't understand the depths of your issues? This is what Isaiah means when he says, my, head, my ways are here from you. Because if you look back at the verse uh, that's right behind me, he says, why saith, O oh, Jacob, and speaketh, O oh, Israel, my way is hid from the Lord. Like, God can't see your problems. That's what, he, that's what God is saying. Why are you even saying this? Why are you saying I don't understand the depths of your issues? You know, it does not mean that uh, their course, it doesn't mean that their course of life or their prayers are not heard or anything like that. It means that they are acting like God doesn't see what they're going through. These people were acting as though their problems were so bad that even God couldn't help them. So we do the same thing, you know, like God doesn't understand what we're going through intellectually we'll sit there and claim God cares about us but practically you know many times we, we will deny it we don't deny it with our lips but we deny it with our actions you know we may pray and then we we, we start trying to fix it we try to fix the problem ourselves because we don't like God's timing God knows the difficulties and the problems of our life he knows in verse 11 you know he talks about being our, our shepherds I didn't read that verse because he knows our need. He can quiet the storms of life, but sometimes he wants us to learn from the storm. Sometimes while you're in the, in the storm, he asks the question, you know, sometimes, no. Sometimes when we're in the storm, we need to ask the question. That's what I'm trying to say. We need to ask the question, what could God be telling me? Why is he putting me through this? Now, so, there's not always a reason you go through stuff. But I'm saying, sometimes you could ask the question, what is God trying to tell me? What is God trying to change about me? What is God, what, what is God trying to get out of me? And sometimes the lesson just might be what verse 28 says here. Verse 28 says, has thou not known, has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not? He don't get tired. Neither is he weary. There is no searching of his understanding. So in verse 21, he asked them the question earlier, and I read it, you know, where he said, have you not heard? Have you not known? You know, have, have it been, uh, haven't it been told to you from the beginning since you was a little kid? Have you not understand, uh, understood about me since the foundation of the earth? Well, he went back and tapped into their knowledge of him um, that their forefathers uh, no doubt had told them about when they was kids. And he does the same thing here in this verse. He says, haven't you heard? Don't you know? The same can be said about us today. We all know better. We have said, you know, we've had so many examples to draw off of. Um, and, 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 and we can't put limitations on God. It, we can't say that this is how far God can go. You know, he faints not. That's what the verse says. Nor is he weary. He created uh, all of us. And he never gets tired. He never gets tired. He never gets weary. He's always on guard, ready to help us. Why would you say such a thing that your problems are hid from him? You know, and I love this part of this verse where he says, there is no searching in his understanding. You know, in other words, in other words, this is what this is saying. You just don't understand how much I understand what you and your situation are. So he... God is saying, you just don't understand how much I understand you and your situation. <laughs> the Bible tells us he can number the hairs on our head. So you, so you tell me he can't understand your issues? 
you playing God cheap when you say you just don't, he just don't get it. He knows your weakness. He knows your strength. He knows your needs. He knows your faults. That, that's why we ought to turn to him for everything. That's why when we worship, you know, we should worship everything from within us. Not just sitting in the church like a bump on a log and do nothing. He's amazing. He deserves our praise. Verse 29. I'm trying to get through this. He giveth power to the faint and then to them that have no might. He increases strength. So he says he gives strength to his people and helps them to help themselves. You know, he's there for those that, that are ready to, to faint under their, their stress and their issues and their afflictions. Usually because they don't get you know, they're usually about to faint because they don't get an immediate deliverance from, from, from what they want. You know, people want to quit on God when stuff don't happen in an instant or when their prayer is not answered at once. You know, our promises that are not fulfilled, we get weary and we want to faint. And it's, so, you know, he will help all of those who, who have a humble dependence on him. Not a haughty dependence on him, but a humble dependence, knowing that... God is the only person that's keeping you. And you give it all over to him. You know, these are the kind of people that God will give a fresh supply of spiritual strength to. He can't help those people who feel like they can handle things, you know, that, that they can handle, you know, everything on their own. The people that use God as their spare tire in, instead of their steering wheel. He talks to these kind of people in verse 30. Look at verse 30. He says, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. You know, a lot of us are like verse 30. You know, a lot of us still depend on ourselves and our time of need instead of waiting on the Lord. When you're young, you feel invincible. You feel like you can conquer the world, eat all kinds of crap, get no sleep, you know, live life on the edge. But guess what? Isaiah says that even the young man is going to faint. They ultimately fail. But as soon as they stop trusting themselves, um, uh, Let's look at verse 31, and this uh, is such a good verse. They're going to, you know, they're going to see the silliness in trying to trust themselves. Verse 31 says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is one of the most famous verses in the Bible. It says, but those that wait on the Lord and by faith, I'm talking about rely on him and, and commit themselves to his guidance, they will find uh, that God will not fail them. Faith like children waiting on their parents, knowing that their parents have their best interests in, in, at heart and will take care of their needs. That's the kind of faith you got. Faith like an employee to his employer. You know, you work all week on the job. Uh, you do the job that's asked of you, and then you trust that they're going to have that paycheck for you. Faith like a client to a lawyer. You know, you put all your faith in their hands, that they'll do all they can on your behalf. Faith like a GPS. We do everything that the GPS tells us to do in hopes that we're going to get to the place that we want to go. We need to trust and wait on the Lord the same way. You know, he sometimes hides himself, but... We still need to wait on the Lord um, because in time, in his own time, he's going to show itself. And you should renew your strength. Every day is a new day with God's promises. He will renew your strength, which implies what? That you're already strong. That means he's going to renew it. You're already strong. You know, first he gives a general promise. He says those who wait will gain st new strength. You know, uh, and then there are three specific promises for those that wait on the Lord. One, they will mount up with eagle, with wings like eagles. Mount up! <laughs> this would seem to point to their ability to rise up above any of their problems. You know, um, through your life experience or through your relationship with the Lord, you can rise up above your problems if you just wait on Him. Eagles are swift and strong and rise in their flying as though they were headed to heaven. Two, they will run and not get tired. Three, they shall walk and not faint. And, and you know why they won't faint? 
because you can lean on him. You can throw the weight of all your cares on him. He'll carry your burdens and you won't get faint. You know, some say these three stages it, it, are growth in your relationship with God. They say when you're a young Christian, you mount up like eagles. When, uh, the adult Christian shall run and the mature Christian just going to walk knowing God got this. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the tougher the situation, the more we need to draw on the Lord and, and literally cling to him. And I'm going to leave you with this. I think I'm 45 minutes in already. Man, I just you know, I talked about throwing the weight of your problems on God. You know, we don't like to wait. You know, we're impatient people. And when we think of waiting, you know, we're apt to respond with uh, the pun, wait. You know, wait, wait, what's that? Wait, isn't that what made the bridge collapse? Y'all gonna get that in a minute. Of course, we're not talking about wait, W-E-I-G-H-T. We're talking about wait, W-A-I-T. But, you know, and those two words, wait and wait, are not always unrelated because one of the things we need to do in waiting on the Lord is to cast our weighty burdens on him. And I'm going to leave you with this. One final thought. There was a little boy fishing, and he wasn't catching anything. And a man came by and asked him, are you fishing, little boy? And the little boy said, no, I'm not fishing. I'm just drowning worms. And sometimes that's, that, that might be how we feel when we're waiting on God. Like we're just drowning worms. Like nothing is working. Nothing we're trying to do is work. And, and we're just drowning in our sorrows. But we need to hold on to faith. Keep the pole in the water. And, and, and just trust with all insurance that a fish is going to come. Now that's faith. Don't give up. It's just knowing that that fish is going to come. And that's the end of our lesson. Next week's lesson will be uh, from the book of Daniel, chapter 3, verses 19 through 28. And the title of the lesson is Faith Amidst the Fiery Furnace. That's going to be a good one. So remember to subscribe, to subscribe and, and to this channel. Comment. Y'all, man, y'all made me so happy last week. I saw everybody. Good lesson, Deke. Oh, th glad you're back. That does a lot for me. So thank you. Uh, comment and share. Uh, your comments help me in sharing the lesson. Send it to somebody. Uh, will we'll help by growing it and planting a seed. So let's dismiss. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, please, Lord, be acceptable in your sight. O oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Sunday school with the Deke. It's the place to be I know the perfect school just for you and me Fill you with the word, it'll set you free So grab a seat, it's Sunday